Professor in the Department of Economics here at the University of Utah, and I'm the director of the Barbara L. and Norman C. Tanner Center for Nonviolent Human Rights Advocacy. And it's my privilege to welcome you to our fifth annual international conference on human rights, conflict resolution, nonviolence, and peace. Your program says that Dean David Rudd of the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences uh, is to do this, uh, this welcome. Unfortunately, he's ill and he can't be with us tonight, um, but I'm happy to, to be able to fill in for him. This year's conference is on water, conflict, and human rights, emerging challenges and solutions. And this is a timely topic. This past July, the United Nations adopted Resolution 64-292, recognizing a human right to clean drinking water and sanitation. In adopting this resolution, the UN noted that about 1 billion people lack access to safe drinking water, 2.6 billion people lack access to basic sanitation, and 1.5 million children under the age of five die each year from diseases related to the lack of clean water and sanitation. In various places around the globe, the provision of water is undergoing profound institutional changes due to increased privatization of water sources. Here in the U.S. West and in many other places, population growth and increased demand for energy place great strains on water supplies. The predicted impact of climate change on water access makes all of these challenges even more pressing. Over the next three days, our distinguished keynote speakers, prominent researchers, government officials, and engaged citizens will discuss these challenges and help all of us build uh, the sort of understanding necessary for developing durable solutions to these problems. Our ability to engage in this work is a direct result of the generosity of the Tanner family, Barbara and Norman Tanner and Deb Sorter. I want to thank them for their vision in establishing this center and for their extraordinarily generous support. Please join me in thanking them. Each Tanner Center conference is organized by a distinct team of Utah faculty who develop the theme, invite the speakers, and organize the program. I want to thank this year's team for their outstanding work. Johanna Watsinger Tharp, Associate Dean of the College of Humanities and Director of the International Studies Program. Sylvia Torti, Research Assistant Professor and Manager of the Rio Mesa Center. Steve Burian, Associate Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering. Robert Adler, the James I. Farr Chair and Professor of Law, S.J. Quinney College of Law. Deborah Cox Callister of the Department of Communication. David Derizotis, Professor in the College of Social Work. And Terry Morasco of Natural Resource Project Management. In addition, beyond the faculty who do the mechanics of organizing the conference, a number of departments and centers on campus and other groups in the community provide resources that allow us to carry out um, this enterprise. This year's conference has benefited from our partners, the College of Humanities, the S.J. Quinney College of Law, and the College of Social and Behavioral Science. I also want to thank our sponsors, the Herbert C. and Grace A. Tanner Humanities Center, the American West Center, the Office of the Vice President for Research, the Pax Natura Foundation, and the Rio Mesa Center at the University of Utah. And we've also benefited from the participation of several co-sponsors who provided a, a variety of kinds of support, including the American Water Resource Association, the Central Utah Water Conservancy District, CH2M Hill, Clyde Snow Attorneys at Law, the Great Basin Water Network, Laughlin Associates, the Nature Conservancy, and at the University of Utah, the Departments of Biology, Communication, Civil and Environmental Engineering, Philosophy, and Sociology, and programs in Environmental Humanities, Environmental Studies, International Studies, Latin American Studies, Peace and Conflict Studies, the Office of Sustainability, and the Global Change and Ecosystem Center. That's a long list, but all of them have been necessary to make this work, and so join me in thanking them. Please. Um, I also want to thank Kim Koronik, uh, associate, uh, Assistant Professor of Sociology and Associate Director of the Center, uh, the staff of the Center, including Alita Tu and Victoria Medina, and also George Cheney, who was Director of the Center when the planning for this conference was getting started and who provided initial uh, leadership in its initial stages, um, who's now at the University of Texas. Um, please stay for a reception after tonight's uh, talk. We'll have drinks and hors d'oeuvres in, in the exhibit hall, in the Great Hall, Outside, we'll have exhibits from the Salt Lake Arts Academy, the Visual Arts Institute, the West High, International Baccalaureate students, and performances by students from the Mundi Project. 
And now, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Sylvia Torti of the Rio Mesa Center, who will introduce tonight's keynote speaker. Thank you, Tom, and good evening. Um, I'm Sylvia Torti of the Rio Mesa Center, the University of Utah's interdisciplinary field station located along about three miles of the Dolores River in southeastern Utah. Um, Water is something we think a lot about at Rio Mesa. The Dolores River is one of the major tributaries of the Colorado River, which in turn supplies water to some 25 million users downstream. And so we've been really pleased to be part of this conference, which overlaps with so many areas that interest the researchers, educators, and students who use the center. It's a real honor to be, have been asked to introduce Maud Barlow this evening. In considering how I should introduce her, a couple of adjectives kept coming to mind, and they are vision, rigor, and tenacity. Maud, Bar Maud Barlow is a visionary. She was one of the early activists to recognize and give voice to the growing issues surrounding availability and just delivery of clean water across the world. It's worth remembering that almost 900 million people worldwide do not have access to clean water. Her voice early on helped spark an awareness that has become an international chorus. She is rigorous in her scholarship. She is the recipient of 10 honorary doctorates as well as many awards, including the 2005 Right Livelihood Award, known as the Alternative Nobel, given by the Swedish Parliament, who noted, and I quote, exemplary and long-standing worldwide work for trade justice and the recognition of the fundamental right to water. She is the national chairperson of the Council of Canadians, Canada's largest citizen advocacy organization, and the co-founder of Blue Planet Project, which has worked internationally to promote water as a human right. She is also the author or co-author of 16 books, including the international bestseller, Blue Covenant, The Global Water Crisis, and The Coming Battle for the Right to Water. And Maud Barlow is tenacious. For the last 25 years, she has consistently and effectively articulated the growing water crisis. She's been an outspoken critic of water privatization and has worked on behalf of the disenfranchised for whom clean and abundant water is not a given, as it is for most of us, but an expensive daily challenge. Her work and support has helped to empower communities across the globe. In 2008 and 2009, she served as senior advisor on water to the 63rd president of the United Nations General Assembly. Her work helped pave the way for the UN resolution, which was passed last July, declaring access to, and again I quote, safe and clean drinking water and sanitation to be a human right essential to the full enjoyment of life and all other human rights. We are fortunate to have Maud Barlow with us to deliver the first of two keynotes of the Tanner Center Conference on Water, Conflict, and Human Rights. Please join me in welcoming Maud Barlow. Wow, what a lovely introduction. Thank you so, so much, Sylvia. And thank you, Tom, for the um, lovely words of opening as well. And thank you all for being here this evening. I'm, I'm absolutely delighted. Um, and not that I um, uh, compare myself in any way, but when I hear a, a beautiful introduction like that, I think of something Winston Churchill once said when he heard a very uh, wonderful introduction about himself. He said he could hardly wait to hear what he had to say. So... <laughs> Obviously, good introduction should come after in case people think, oh, she wasn't that great. I don't know. <laughs> and I'm delighted to be here for the fifth annual Barbara and Norman Tanner International Conference on Human Rights, Conflict Resolution, and Nonviolence and Peace. And I share Tom's uh, gratitude to the Tanner family for, um, for this wonderful event every year and for being part of it um, this year. And just thrilled to be here with colleagues, smart, wonderful colleagues, um, and you're going to love uh, all of them. And uh, Peter Glick, um, I think, is your second keynote um, tomorrow, but I think he's here tonight as well. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about the big picture. Can you hear me? Is this good if I get in real close? Um, and then come back here a little bit. But I think it's important to take a few minutes to kind of situate us um, globally. I guess the most important thing, I'll start off with some negatives, but I will get some positives in there near the end, I promise. I, I don't believe in dumping all over people, but I do think that it's very important for us to get certain basics um, down pat. And I guess the very first is that we are running out of water in our planet. Um, 
And this was supposed to be something that could not happen. Every single one of us learned back in about grade six that it was impossible for this to happen because we have an exact specific amount of water that travels around and around in the hydrologic cycle and it can't go anywhere. We all learned that. And we maybe learned that we shouldn't pollute it, but we certainly never learned that there was any way we could run out of it. Um, but this wasn't true. Our teachers weren't lying, but um, what they were telling us is not, um, un we, we now know is not true. We're doing a number of things. One is that we are still massively polluting our surface and even groundwater. Every day we dump two million tons of sewage, agricultural, industrial waste into the world's water. This is the equivalent of the weight of the entire human population of 6.8 billion people. Or to put it another way, the amount of wastewater produced annually is about six times more water than exists in all of the rivers of the world uh, put together. A recent study uh, found that 80% of the world's rivers are in crisis, and this affects 5 billion people, which of course is most of us on the planet. And by the way, the worst um, aggravation, the worst um, uh, damage to these rivers was in the more so-called um, sophisticated or first world countries. So that you, you might think it would not be, but in fact, the worst damage was in North America and Europe. Uh, that's one thing we're doing. The second is that we're mining groundwater faster than it can be replenished by nature. We're using bore well technology that didn't exist 100 years ago. That you've got to imagine bore wells that go into the ground that are, are they go as deep into the ground as skyscrapers go into the, into the air. Um, and they are pumping this water far, far faster than nature can replenish it. Again, a brand new study, a global survey from many universities led by Mark, Mark Bierkens of Utrecht University in the Netherlands found that the rate of groundwater depletion doubled between 1960 and 2000, but is exponentially increasing. And just to give, uh, and, and, he's, and they said, and we know this, that there, we are literally hitting the bottom of the water tables in cities as diverse as Beijing, uh, Mumbai, India, and Mexico City, as we literally pump that water and have to go deeper and deeper. And so what we're, we're finding are what um, scientists are calling hot stains, places in the world that are not just experiencing drought. We always hear the word drought, and that's a more friendly word than, than perhaps the reality, because with the notion of drought comes the end of drought. But in many p parts of the world, we're actually um, pumping the rivers and our aquifers dry. Um, this same study said that if you were to do a comparison in North America, and they, they said the, the place to look would be the, the Great Lakes, they said if, if and we don't know because we haven't, we're not mapping our groundwater properly in North America, but if we are pumping around the Great Lakes as quickly as we're pumping groundwater uh, around the world, <clears throat> the Great Lakes will be bone dry in 80 years. And you could not make that up. I mean, you, you know, these are very, very distressing, I find very distressing um, reports that are, are underlining what a lot of us know anecdotally. And if anyone thinks that a large body of water cannot d disappear, I'd point them to the Aral Sea, which was a lake that was the fourth largest lake in the world in the former Soviet Union that was pumped mercilessly to grow cotton in the desert, now just a shadow of itself. Lake Chad in Africa, which was the sixth largest lake in, in the world, which is 90% depleted. Um, your own Ag Ogallala Aquifer here in the United States is only producing about half the food it was producing in the 1970s. So it is entirely possible to displace massive bodies of water. Um, so that's the, the third then, is not just the pumping of groundwater, but the displacement and the moving of water from watersheds, from where I would argue it's needed by nature, um, to where we want it to grow crops in desert, to produce commodities and industrial products for the global market, something called virtual water trade. A virtual water trade is where you use water to produce something and then you export that product or that commodity out of the watershed and out of the country. Um, a very clear example, and a couple of years ago I was in Lake Na Naivasha in the Rift Valley in Kenya in Eastern Africa very beautiful lake, very exquisite lake, and the most gorgeous color of blue. And we were, we were on uh, in an old boat with an elderly, a Maasai elder who was standing and, 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 and rowing us. Um, and, you know, we took us by the, the hippopotamus, the last wild hippopotamus herd in, in, um, in that part of the world. 
And I looked at this island, and it had wildebeests and giraffes and, uh, and pelicans around it. And I said, you know, that just looks like the movie Out of Africa. And he said, that would be because that's where Out of Africa was filmed, right there, <laughs> you know? So you could kind of see Robert Redford landing his plane and Meryl Streep waiting for him. Well, the tragedy of Lake Naivasha is that it's being used to grow roses for the European rose markets. So European, Dutch, some African agribusiness rose companies are totally surrounding the lake and literally um, it's, it's about a quarter um, depleted now, but they can actually tell you when they expect it to be gone and the companies are already looking at other lakes um, to, to move to. Uh, Americans are st uh, stunned when I tell them that a third of your daily water use, that is surface and groundwater, not only leaves watersheds, but it leaves the country in the form of virtual exports, mostly um, commodities. And it often comes from the parts of this country that have the very least rain and the very least ability to, to lose that water. Um, and so we also move water around the world into big thirsty cities. We take it from rural communities, from wilderness, from rivers, and we move it to cities, 5, 10, 20, 30 million people. And if those cities are anywhere near the ocean, they're dumping that water as waste into the ocean when they're finished with it. The same study of groundwater found that at least 25% of the rise in sea level is due directly to the displacement of land-based water now being dumped into oceans around the world. So when we think of it as strictly being climate change, it's not in the way we've thought it. Climate change, yes, of course, through greenhouse gas emissions, but when you move water from a watershed, you dry up the soil. And when that happens, you create desert. A um, scientist friend of mine says, look, here's how it looks. You take the, the yellow of the sun and the blue of the water, and it makes green of vegetation. And if you remove the blue from the water, the sun hits that soil and, and dries it up. And we are creating desert in more than 100 countries in the world. Here in the U.S., the National Research Defense Council says in a recent study that 400 counties in 14 states face extreme risk to water um, availability, and they, they say this is a 14 percent, sorry, 14 times increase from previous existing um, estimates. So the, the, the issue here, I think, is that we are not only destroying and, and displacing, but doing it in what my Canadian colleague David Suzuki calls exponentially. We're doing the, we're exponential destruction, and so you can't see one and one makes two, and two and two makes four. When it's exponential, you can't see it coming, and you can't gauge when the, when, when the end of a lake or a river or an aquifer is going to come. One last study, um, and this was done in 2009 by a bunch of large companies that use water, including Coca-Cola, and it was um, um, uh, coordinated by the World Bank. And they said that by 2030, which I will remind you is not very far away, the demand for water in our world will outstrip supply by 40%. It's an absolutely stunning statistic and probably the worst that we have seen. And it bespeaks of untold suffering in the world. Now, these facts are the resi result of what I consider to be a cavalier attitude that humanity has had toward nature generally, or certain modern humans. I should be very careful to say that because most Aboriginal First Nations communities, many traditional communities around the world still live in harmony with nature. But the more consumer-oriented we get, the more sophisticated, the more so-called, the more urbanized we get, the more stuff we have, the more water we're destroying, and the more global we go in terms of our trade, in terms of, you know, more stuff and, and uh, you know, needing to have the cheapest goods possible, the more we are um, consuming uh, every single resource um, that exists. So this notion of the myth of abundance is a, a, an underlying problem, and we have, to, we have to find a way to turn it around. Humans have seen, modern humans have seen water as a resource for our pleasure, our profit, and our convenience. And so we've taken it from where it is needed for the uh, functioning of a healthy hydrologic cycle to where we want it. And so we uh, dump whatever we want in it and we grow whatever we want, wherever we want, however we want. We create, we produce industrial goods wherever we want, however we want. Uh, we promote the notion of unlimited growth. 
which I think is destroying the planet. And an American environmentalist said was that unlimited growth has the same DNA as the cancer cell. It has to turn on its host in order to survive, which I think is an incredible um, image. Uh, and we have, we have continued to build uh, and promote unregulated trade, unregulated investment. My country is right now negotiating a trade agreement with Europe for the first time will allow service companies to uh, compete against municipalities, uh, social programs, uh, water systems, schools, universities, and so on. So the, they're, they're getting more and more intrusive. And we'll have, like NAFTA has, this, cha this ability for corporations to challenge um, the government of another country if it changes the rules because maybe it's learned something about the product, that it has, it's a carcinogen or whatever. It won't matter. If, you, if you, you change the rules and that company's making less money, it gets to um, sue you for financial compensation. So this is, there are over 2,600 bilateral trade agreements in the world that have these uh, investor state provisions. So we more and more turn the regulatory responsibilities away from government over to these huge corporations um, like Walmart, which has a bigger G, uh, uh, sorry, annual profit than the GDP of 161 countries. And by the way, I noticed today when I, I live in Ottawa, Canada, I got on the plane to fly to Chicago, then to come here, and on the back page of one of our, our, our big newspaper, our, our, our big, biggest national newspapers called the Globe and Mail, kind of, I guess, would be like your New York Times. Um, and the huge ad on the back page is for Scottsdale, Arizona, for Canadians to come in and buy up uh, condominiums and, uh, you know, all sorts of uh, deserted uh, development. And, you know, saying we're going to have, we've got golf courses, we've got, you'll have a swimming pool in, in every, <laughs> in, in every uh, you know, for every home kind of thing. And it's just, I, I was remembering that um, Arizona is the home to where they're building the largest water theme park in the world. And they're going to have waves so big that you can whitewater raft on them and surf on them and, and, and rivers that go so fast you can, you know, whitewater raft down the river. Uh, so we do this. We have we give no thought to water. We 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 decide to subsidize biofuels to to grow cars to feed fuel or to grow fuel to feed cars. I mean, and and we we don't stop and ask how much water um, is going to be destroyed. And I tell you, a huge amount of water is consumed with the creation of biofuels. Same with nuclear. Same with uh, gas fracking, natural gas fracking, which is becoming a huge issue all over North America with hundreds and hundreds of operations now exploring and pumping that uh, poisoned water, chemical-laced water, um, down into rock fissures to um, separate them and release the natural gas, leaving behind um, huge amounts of poisoned water. Um, tar sands. We haven't asked the questions about tar sands. In Alberta, we have the biggest tar sands in the world. They've taken down a, a boreal forest the size of Greece, um, and to get at this bitumen, and to, to extract the heavy oil from it, they have to steam blast it with water. And what gets left behind is huge dams, huge holding dams of absolute poison water that is so poisoned that when the ducks arrive on it, um, they die. Um, and we're fighting this very hard. Well, you should know that the government of Canada with some American uh, pipeline companies is building a huge pipe, two big pipelines, one to bring raw bitumen from northern Alberta to the American side of the Great Lakes and another to go right over the top of the Ogallala Aquifer um, to go to refineries in the Gulf of Mexico. And we are looking for uh, American um, colleagues and networks to work with because we must stop this pipeline. Bitumen is highly corrosive and if it if it were to leak into the Ogallala Aquifer or any of the water systems um, along the way, it would be a very serious issue. But we, we separate this all out. One has to do with oil or one has to do with natural gas or one has to do with biofuels or whatever, and we don't stop and ask, is there an impact on water? Now, as a result of this, there are conflicts growing up in the world around this dwindling supply of fresh water. The most obvious, of course, is the one between rich and poor, where if you have money, you can have all the water for whatever you want or need it for, um, and as much as you want. Um, and if you don't, you die. Uh, the unclean water, um, lack of access to, to, to sanitation and water, is the biggest killer of children in our world. 
It kills more children every year than HIV, AIDS, war, and um, all violence uh, put together. Uh, there's a new study from the World Health Organization that says that in the global south, a child dies of waterborne disease every three and a half seconds. So we are not, we're not beating this. In, in spite of the mo uh, Millennium Development Goals of the United Nations, which were to half the number of people without ad ad adequate access to water, uh, by 2015, you can't catch it when you keep making the water crisis itself worse, no matter how many pipes you build and no matter how many communities you connect. For instance, a new study from the UN says that right now one in three people in Africa don't have access to clean, adequate uh, water and sanitation. In uh, 10 years, it will be one in two, unless something dramatic happens to change what we see um, as the future now. And of course, this is always alongside um, great wealth. And lest you think this is only in the global south, you should know that in Detroit, Michigan, they've cut the water uh, to families, well, officially to something like 53 or 4,000 residences, um, but unofficially the communities there tell us it's more like 90,000 residences where people cannot pay for their water bill. Mostly African American, um, single mothers, older people, and of course now social services is coming in and taking the children away because they don't have water. So this notion, the water, the price of water is going up everywhere. This notion that it's only going to be an issue of poverty or it lack of access in the global south is absolutely wrong. We're also seeing large or wealthy countries, particularly superpowers, looking outside their borders for new sources of water. So China, for instance, is building a series of dams and pipes to take the water from the Tibetan Himalayas, which feeds all of the Great Lakes of Asia, and diverting it to China. A lot of people see problems between China and India growing. We also have land and water grabs where countries uh, like Saudi Arabia, China, India, are frightened that they're not going to have enough water to feed their people in the future because China, for instance, is using its water to make all the rubber duckies and shower curtain liners for the, for the world. So they've converted their water and they have 4,000 cities in danger of being engulfed by the resulting desert. Um, so these countries are looking and buying up land, in, particularly in Africa. It's called land grabs, but it's also for the water. And these countries, plus a couple of others, plus big investment pools, have already bought up a land size uh, in Africa that twice the size of, the, um, of Great Britain. Um, and this is going to have big ramifications geopolitically. Who, you know, who owns this water and whose rights are being trampled here? And then I guess the question I've been most involved in then is who gets to make decisions about access? Who controls this dwindling um, source of water? Is water a commodity uh, or it, to be put on the market, uh, open market for sale like running shoes or Coca-Cola? Or is it a commons to be collectively cared for and managed together? Does it belong to those who got there first? Does it belong to those who have money or political influence? Or is it a public trust heritage? And if it is, how do we ensure that right? Uh, recently, there was a conference on water in London, England, and an investment banker said, gave a speech, and he said there, I thought this sort of summed it up. He talked about the world water crisis. He gave some of the stats I just gave, and then he said, there's buckets and buckets of money to be made from this crisis. And I thought that kind of summed up the problem that we have here. <clears throat> and I want to say that I understand there's a commercial aspect to water, so I'm not suggesting that there isn't. The question isn't, is there a commercial use or aspect? The question is, who owns it and who controls it and who makes the decisions around um, access? Forms of commodification are a number. There's utilities, water services. In the 90s, the early 90s, the World Bank started to tell poor countries, if you want money for water services, you have to take private companies, usually one of the two big, Veolia or Suez from, uh, from France. We'll do the contract, we'll, it'll all be secret, you don't need to worry about it. And of course, um, if people couldn't pay the, the, the rates that uh, were suddenly sky high, um, that was too bad. Uh, there's been a real fight back against these companies to the extent that Suez is basically pulled out of, of Latin America. There's been so much unrest. When we have bottled water, um, which is a form of collective insanity, if you think of it, really, um, 
I mean, the bottled water coming, the bottled water is not as safe as the water coming out of your tap. Uh, and any residues that we're worried about in tap water is, will also be in bottled water, but it's not regulated, it's, it's, it does, it's not tested the way your tap water is, um, and it comes in plastic that if you were to take that plastic bottle and fill it up with the amount of oil it took just to make that one bottle, it would be quarter full of oil. Last year, if you were to take the single bottles of plastic, just water, not everything else that we drank in the world and put the, them end to end, they would reach the moon and back 65 times. And then we have water markets. And water markets are the newest thing and something I'm deeply involved in because I'm very worried about them. I think they're deep, deadly wrong. A market is where you convert a water license to a water property or a trading property. And you actually say the license now belongs to you and you can trade it for um, you know, f for more, the, the, the idea f behind it is because it now makes money, you're going to use less of it and sell your excess. But I've studied it around the world where they have water markets and it's not how it happens. In Australia, because they were so frightened about the death of the Murray Darling in 1993, uh, or because, I should roll back, they had these huge agribusiness companies, big cotton, rice conglomerates, wine conglomerates, taking up that water and using it for their product, which they ship out of the country. This is the biggest, United States, Canada, Brazil, and Australia are the four biggest virtual water exporters in the world. But Australia doesn't have water to do this. So they decided in 1993 to convert the licenses for these companies to, to property rights and said, okay, now you can, you own them, now trade them. Well, instead of trading them for more, um, um, uh, you know, uh, conser conserving way of, or, you know, uh, of using the, the water, what they did was the big conglomerate started buying up the small farmers. And then the price of water went up. It went up from $2 a megaliter to $2,400 a megaliter in one decade. And then when the new government came in and wanted to buy that water back to save the Murray Darling, they couldn't afford it. So now it's big investment bankers, international investment and hedge funds coming in and buying up that water and telling the farmers um, what they should uh, be growing. I think I'd like to be in olives. Yes, olives is the big new thing in dry old Australia. And don't let the... Don't let the flood make you think it's all better. That was a, um, a horrible but un unusual situation. They still have their water crisis. Um, Chile has also gone totally private. They've gone so private, they actually have public auctions where they auction off the actual water. And Canadian mining companies come down there and they bid against local indigenous peoples, against farmers, peasants, and so on, <clears throat> even municipalities. And they can always outbid because they have more money. Um, and so huge areas of Chile's water actually belongs to foreign transnationals. Now my position, you might guess, um, is that I disagree with um, the commodification of water. I think the answer to the question who owns water should be that no one owns water. That water belongs to the earth. It belongs to all species, including humans, but not exclusively us. It belongs to future generations and it belongs to the ecosystem. And it also, I argue, is a fundamental human right. And we are building a water justice movement here in the United States and North America and around the world. And we're trying to build and pull together two separate threads around water that have been operating separately out there but have to come together if we're to uh, find a solution to this thing. One thread tend to be the scientists, environmentalists, academics, who are out there sounding the alarm on the actual physical water crisis, and they're doing incredibly important work. At the other le end has, have been the human rights people, the development people, the justice people who've been working and saying, well, the, the inequitable access is the crisis here, and if we just find enough money to, uh, you know, to deal with the poverty issue, then that will be all right. And I think you have to put the two together, because even if we find all the money in the world to hook up those uh, billion people who don't have clean water and the 2.6 billion people who don't have a a sanitation. Even if we did this tomorrow, we don't have the water in the world unless we start treating it differently. So we have to put the ecological crisis and the human crisis together, both in our analysis and in our solutions. And so I would, um, and, and I'm going to give you then the three principles upon which I think we need to build a water secure world. And I'm going to hear in my head as I speak, some people here thinking, impossible, 
you know, she doesn't know the American West, the crazy, archaic, difficult laws, you know, the prior, uh, prior access, the, you know, first in time, you know, all of the legal ramifications of, of what this means. I don't care what the current laws are. I'm going to stand here tonight and say to you that if human, the human um, persons, race, whatever we are, the human species, if we don't get our act together on this water issue and we do, don't do it sooner rather than later, we are going to have terrible conflicts and we're going to see more and more deaths. I am very sure of this. And I don't want us to wait until we hit the water wall and then say, okay, now let's think about you know, some serious ways of, of looking at this. I want us to get in front of it. And so I'm going to, I know all the arguments against taking s some simple principles and making them real, but I think if we could base, uh, build on these, I actually believe we could, we could catch this thing. So, and is my firm, uh, as I say, my firm belief that if we don't do it, um, nature will do this for us. So my three principles are the following. First of all is that nature put water where it is needed. And when we, pl we play God, when we move it massively around the world to build huge dams, to build huge pipelines, to move water from aquifers and rivers, I understand there is some need for that. I'm not saying, you know, we can go back to a pure state, but this cavalier notion of moving water from where it exists to where we want it to, to be is destroying so many um, ecosystems and watersheds. Uh, there's a World Bank official said, you know, approvingly, one day water will move around the world like oil. And they actually see that as a positive thing. There will be a crisscross of pipes all over the world um, carrying water. And you should know that Sitka, Alaska is now um, gearing up production to export water um, to Las Vegas. Um, they're not sure how by tanker. Uh, there's been a lot of talk, of course, in my country of taking our mighty rivers that run north, and that's where most of our water is, and, sh and reversing the flow and, and having it move south. That would be kind of like a Three Gorges Dam engineering feat. Um, I keep saying it's not Canada's water, it's ecosystem water. It belongs in the watershed. I, I don't think we should be turning it to come to Toronto either. So this isn't saying Canada won't share our water. It, this is the notion of leaving it where it, 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 it belongs. So what we need to do is we need to, in fact, protect and restore watersheds. We need to conserve. We need to protect source water with very strict law. Martin Luther King said legislation may not change the heart, but it will restrain the heartless, which I think is one of the loveliest things anybody could ever say. So we need to support local sustainable food production and we need to do this with tough policy. We need to reject the mantra of unlimited growth. It is absolutely killing the planet and not just in, in, in terms of, of water. Um, and so clearly you won't be surprised that I strongly support the Great Basin Water Network here um, in Utah. Uh, and it's strong and principled opposition to the proposed pipeline of the Southern Nevada Water Authority to take uh, 65 billion gallons of water every year from uh, Nevada and Utah to ship to um, uh, Las Vegas. And it's only one of many proposals, of course, to get at this watershed. And one of the dozens proposed all over the West, all driven by un the three Ps I call them, population, pollution, and, and profit. We have got to stop taking the water to where we are. And that ad in the Globe and Mail today just said it all to me. It didn't say come and live in a harmonious way with nature. And there's a lovely river that you can build a small place on if you take care of it. It said, come and we'll build you a big monster house and you'll have your own swimming pool and your own golf course. This is the wrong way to think about nature and, and, and these, these wildernesses. Um, you are, we are, you are here, the stewards of this water, and I believe it would have a devastating effect um, if, if you start allowing the basin here to be tapped, because I think it's going to be very hard to turn the tap off once it's been turned on. And I have to say to you that all over the United States, there are people and communities not waiting for the municipal, state, or federal government to protect their water sources, and they're passing local ordinances saying just is off ground. Uh, in, in Mount Shasta, California, all over New England, local people are coming together and voting against the right 
uh, bottled water companies to come in and, and, uh, and, and take the water. Maine has just introduced a law that if a bottled water company wants to set up shop, it has to go to a vote to the local community. And that's going to stop it because communities don't want these, um, these, that industry um, around. Uh, I just finished uh, editing a book called The Rights of Nature, um, The Case for a Declaration, uh, sorry, The Case for a Unide Universal Declaration on the Rights of Mother Earth, because some of us went to Cochabamba, Bolivia last April at the invitation of Evo Morales, the president, um, when the um, Copenhagen fit talks uh, uh, failed so badly the year before that the climate talks in, in uh, Copenhagen. I called it, um, Ban Ki-moon, the secretary general, uh, hired a, a marketing company to get to make it sexy. So they came up with the term Hopenhagen. And so when you got off the plane in Hopenhagen, you saw a little, I called them Coke elves. All the little Coca-Cola had all these young people dressed in red and handing out Coke and welcoming you. And everywhere you went through the city, there were billboards and videos showing happy children in clean, wonderful water and surrounded by meadows. And it was the climate summit brought to you by Coca-Cola. So I started calling it instead of Copenhagen. I started calling it Copenhagen anyway. So a whole bunch of us went to um, to Cochabamba and, uh, and, and, and came up with this Universal Declaration on the Rights of Mother Earth. And the person who wrote the draft is a wonderful man named Cormac Cullinan. He's written a book called Wild Law, which I recommend to you. But he, Cormac says this, the day will come when the failure of our laws to recognize the right of a river to flow to prohibit acts that destabilize the Earth's climate, or to impose a duty to respect the intrinsic value and right to exist of all life will be as reprehensible as allowing people to be bought and sold. We will only flourish by changing these systems and claiming our identity, as well as assuming our responsibility as members of the Earth community. So this is the next frontier, is, is actually protecting nature itself, not just because it suits us, but because it has its own rights. So that's the first principle. The second principle is that water is a common heritage and a public trust of all people. And this is based on the notion that just by being members of the human family, we all have rights to common heritages, o oceans and atmospheres, genetic diversity, culture, language, wisdom, and of course, fresh water. I would add education and, and health care in there, but I don't want to get into a debate, so I'll, I'll, I'll behave myself. Uh, but these, these central, the, the, the idea is that these are central characteristic um, is, the, the, is of this notion then that, that these belong to us all. These are, these are commons that belong to us all. The central characteristic is the need for careful, collaborative management of water and the allocation based on a, an agreed upon set of principles. In other words, we not, it can't be everybody can't have all they want. We have to agree on what we have. We need 50 year plans. We have to say how much water do we have? What are the demands on it now? What are the demands in 20 years, 30 years, 40 years? And here's how we are going to divvy it up that protects the ecosystem and allows ac equitable access to all. How are we gonna do that? And there are ways to do it. And we have to do this by protecting it through public trust law that sees these common resources as essential to our very existence and therefore necessary to protect the common good. Now, the notion of public trust is growing in this country. There's a lot of exciting public trust uh, law um, right now. Um, and uh, people are taking back their municipal water supplies. And the, I, all through the Global South, this is happening. But the one that's excited us the most, a bunch of us, is that Paris has taken its water supply into public hands for the first time. It's always been private. Those two big companies, Suez and Veolia, started uh, in France running the, the, the water system. And, and within a year, they dropped quite dramatically the um, price of water to uh, the residents of, of, of Paris. Vermont, worried about all the bottled water takings a couple of years ago, brought in public trust for their groundwater. And they basically actually lay out that they, they, they have priorities. Uh, ecosystem protection, uh, equitable access for people's daily needs, and um, local sustainable food production. That comes over uh, use of water for other things. And if you are going to take more than a certain amount per day, you have to get a license, and the government has the right to 
decrease the amount you have or even cut your license off if you're not taking care of it. So this is a very different notion than the market notion where you own it and the government has to come begging to buy it back from you. Um, and very exciting that we're working um, with a group of Canadians and Americans and First Nations communities around the Great Lakes. We want to have, not never to be unambitious, we would, we're working to have a treaty where the Great Lakes will be declared a commons, a public trust, and a uh, protected bioregion. And we're going to, we're launching a report and a whole campaign and project. And I, I love the concept, and I think that it's a proactive way to say, I have the right to care about this water. I may not be a scientist or I may not, you know, know every single facet of it, but I can see my lake receding and I can see the fish dying and I, I want to do more and I have the right to care and I have the right to put my foot down. And we are fighting with our, and Americans and Canadians and First Nations together against, for instance, a shipment of, uh, proposed shipment, well, they've just been given the go-ahead by our awful government in Canada, um, Bruce Power up in the, the Bruce Peninsula on Georgian Bay, which is Huron, Lake Huron, to ship 16 nuclear power, bus-sized nuclear power reactors by ship through down, down, through um, Lake Huron, uh, down through, up through Erie, up through Ontario, th up out the St. Lawrence and across the ocean. If they sink anywhere along there, we're going to have a, a major catastrophe. We need to have a time and place in, in our world, and it has to be soon, when nobody would conceive of moving radioactive material across a body of water that's needed for life and livelihood of 45 million people. So finally, and then I'm going to stop so we can talk together. Uh, the third principle is that water is a human right and that, that no one should have to die or watch their child die of waterborne disease while others are able to profit from it and appropriate it because they have money. Now that may sound like a motherhood to you, but it was a huge battle to get the the right that you talked about, an absolutely huge battle. Water was not included in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948 because at the time no one could imagine it being a problem. But it has been clear for at least two decades that in terms of sheer numbers, it's probably the biggest human rights issue of our time, just in terms of how many people are dying and the fact that if they had money they would not be dying. Uh, it is probably, arguably, the largest greatest human rights violation that we're dealing with. We were up against big companies who didn't want this, who, who wanted water to be declared a need, uh, a human need, not a right, because obviously then the need can be supplied on a for-profit basis. Um, we fought at the World Water Council, which is, um, I call them the Lords of Water. It's a council made up of the World Bank and some parts of the UN and the big water companies, and they have a big forum every three years with like 20, 25,000 people come together from all over the world. And they, they act as if they're setting policy for the world, and in a way they do, but it's really on behalf of their interests. And they refuse every single time, including last meeting, which is in Istanbul, Turkey, to recognize water as a human right. But we were not being deterred, and uh, this past June, Pablo Sono, who's the ambassador from Bolivia to the United Nations, just said, I've had, I've had it, we're not waiting anymore. Our glaciers are melting, our kids are dying, and we are not waiting for another 10 years for a whole bunch more studies. We're putting it to the General Assembly. Are you up or down on this, in or out? Is it a right or isn't it? And five countries really fought this. Canada, the United States, the United Kingdom, Australia, and New Zealand came together and led a little cabal to try to have the wording so, pardon my pun, watered down that it would have meant nothing. Uh, Ambassador Solo stood absolutely firm and said he, they wanted him to take out the word sanitation. No, he wouldn't. They, uh, all sorts of language changes. He said no. So I was in the General Assembly on July 28th with my, some of my staff, my husband who was pacing, pacing. I said, you've got to sit down and stop this. Like, we're nervous enough. Holding hands with my staff and saying, because I knew they was coming to a vote, and I said, we're not going to win this, but we got this far, and it's wonderful language, and we'll get here again, and if we don't win it this year, we'll win it in two years or five years or whatever. And as we held hand, they started to vote, and it comes up on a big electronic screen, and 122 countries voted in favor. Not one country had the guts to vote against, and 41 abstained. And so it was overwhelming, yeah, <laughs> overwhelmingly supported.
uh, there are two nice endings to this story. One of them was two months later, the Human Rights Council, which was all set to take another 10 years of study, felt embarrassed, I think, um, that they'd been preempted this way. They, too, uh, endorsed a human right, they recognized the human right to water and sanitation, but because theirs is based on two existing binding treaties, it now made the General Assembly resolution binding. So we now have binding language for the right to water and sanitation at the UN, and I've just finished writing a paper on what this means for governments and people and how we can use it, because every government, whether they agreed with it or not, is now bound and obliged um, to come up with a plan of action. It has obligations to fulfill. Um, and I think we should start using this where there's water being poisoned. We have a First Nations community in Sarnia uh, in, uh, in Lake Ontario where the water is so poisoned, it's called Chemical Alley. There's so many chemicals on that, uh, in that area that twice as many girl babies is, are being born as boy babies for at least 10 years now. And the fish are all hermaphrodites. I mean, it has been, they've tested them. I think that's a human rights violation, and I think we're going to be able to start using this. So you, the last thing to tell you then is a very wonderful story that these two resolutions have already been test cased uh, and, uh, and won. And this is a story from Botswana. The Kalahari Bushmen live much the way their ancestors did in the desert in the Kalahari. And the government of Botswana is embarrassed by them. The, the president calls them an embarrassing acronym and wants them moved off. He wants, they found diamonds. They want the water for diamond exploration, and they want to put up big echo lodges. So they have all these wonderful tourist uh, areas. They don't want these people there in their spears and loincloths. So they started moving them forcibly off and, and resettling them in resettlement areas. The people kept coming back, so they came in about eight, nine years ago now, and they smashed their bore wells and they cut off their access to water, which is like murder. Um, and they told their young people, if you hunt, we will kill you. If we find you hunting, we'll kill you. And um, we will put in jail anybody who brings water to you. It's an incredibly terrible story. Uh, with Survival International, the Kalahari Bushmen went to court in Botswana and they won a partial victory in 2007. They won the right to go back to their homeland, but not the right to water. Well, you can go back to your desert, but, gee, you can't have water. So they appealed, and they lost the appeal on the right to water the day before the, the first resolution, July 28th resolution on the 27th. They lost their case. Three months later, they took it back to the Supreme Court based on the two United Nations resolutions, and they unanimously won the right not only to return to their homeland, but for their bore well access and for the government to actually reopen that water and to, uh, for restitution for, uh, for the water they didn't have. It's a, an incredibly moving story written up uh, by a, um, an American journalist, or the first part of it, James Workman, called uh, Heart of Dryness. And he describes the matriarch of one of the clans who would so loved her children and grandchildren that she would deny herself her small amount of allocation of water. When she died in the desert and they did an autopsy, her, her heart fell apart like ashes because she dried up, literally, um, to, 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 make, to give her, her quota of water to her family so they could stay in the desert. Um, these are the human rights issues we're dealing with around the world. And um, this is why we have, to, we have to stand up and fight and we have to be water warriors and we have to form this global justice movement um, to fight for clean water, safe water, public water um, for all. I'll just end with um, my favorite quote from Tolkien. And I loved this before the movies, but I, I did love the movies. But this is Gandalf, and Gandalf is standing watching that terrible army of evil. You remember the night when everything evil may, may kill everything good and living, and it's about the death of nature. And I have kind of have uh, uh, Tolkien on the brain because I took a bunch of people to do a tour of the Alberta tar sands uh, a couple of years ago, and we flew over and took a bus and... And I held a press conference and called it Canada's Mordor. And it made huge headlines in the Edmonton Journal, the big paper there. They had a photograph of 
of Mordor from the movie and then a photograph of the Syncrude site. And I'm telling you, that was my, my case made, right? Anyway, one of the energy executives said a silly thing. He should have said this, no comparison, how foolish that is. What he said was, it's not as bad as Mordor. And I thought, no, oh, no, no, <laughs> no, 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 not as bad as the death of nature. What, half of nature you killed? So. Anyway, this is, this is Gandalf, and I, I, I leave the formal part, and I think we have a few minutes to, to chat together, but um, this is, a, this is a, him talking about being a steward, and I'm assuming by the fact that you're here tonight, you care about these issues and that you see yourself as a steward of this beautiful state and of its precious resources. So here's what he says. The rule of no realm is mine, but all worthy things that are in peril as the world now stands, those are my care. And for my part, I shall not wholly fail in my task if anything passes through this night that can still grow fair or bear fruit and flower again in the days to come. For I too am a steward. Did you not know? Thank you. So I think we have 15 minutes or so, um, and I think we have mics. Am I right? Thank you. <laughs> Potentially. Just some good tap water here. Uh, yeah, I had a question. You said uh, you believed in leaving water where it is. Um, but you said that you were against getting rid of all pipelines, all m modes of moving water. I was wondering where you draw the line there. I don't have an exact place in the sand where I would draw a line. I think we have to stop all big projects, like just stop. Uh, all the big dams, all those major pipelines, I think should stop. And then we have to have a societal discussion. I mean, if we could move back a hundred years, I think there's a whole bunch of things we wouldn't do. We probably wouldn't build the kind of sanitation systems we have where, you know, you've got your huge flush toilet and your, you know, five, six, seven places in your house where you could have running water. If, if we knew now what we knew then, we probably would do things differently. So I guess my my sensitivity to this is that there are people who have come, who've built their lives and communities around the water that was brought to them. And so there, we have to have a societal dog, dialogue on what is the appropriate, you know, where is it appropriate? I don't, I can't imagine that we're going to undo every, you know, uh, irrigation channel in the world and so on. But I would say, do, let's put a moratorium on them. Moratorium on them. I, I really feel that this is the place to start. Is that we have to say, what, we've got this motto on our in our climate work: leave leave it in the ground, leave the oil in the ground, leave the water in the ground. This is as my, this is very important that we start having that concept, and then we have the societal um, decision. And and nobody's going to know exactly what's right, but let's stop the big projects now. Don't let that big. Las Vegas pipeline happen. Don't that's once if that happens, you're going to it's going to be a free for all for that water because the problem is and one of the big issues in our world is that if there's a big center of gravity, as in big industry, big population, big money, the water goes there. Mexico City's run out of water, and so they've built pipelines and they just go in and they confiscate the water of indigenous communities. There's one called the Masawas, and they've gone in and they have literally built a fortress, an armed fortress around the water source. And they will, they've got armed guards and dogs and you can't get in there. They have taken the water source of a, of a, of a First Nations, a large First Nations community. And what they said, there's more of us, we have right to it. That's what worries me is that we're thinking, the water is moving to power you know the old saying it moves uphill to water but it's it's moving to it's moving to those centers and i worry about rural communities i worry about national parks and wilderness um indigenous communities those are the ones that are just having their water robbed 
all over the world, and now it's beginning to happen more and more here in North America as well. Yeah. Um, Ms. Barlow, I um, very much appreciate you being here and uh, enjoyed your, your comments and your, your talk. My question is, um, I'm from Nebraska, so when you spoke about the Ogallala, um, I've been learning quite a bit about it since I uh, just began graduate school there. And I read uh, a few days ago in the Omaha paper that speaking about the uh, price of corn and, uh, and grain and things like that, and they said that they actually, with even though they are producing um, a magnificent amount of, of corn products and grains, there's still 70, 70 million bushels uh, behind or, or deficit of where they need to be in order to produce enough corn, et cetera, for uh, ethanol and for corn syrup and for grain for animals and things like that. Um, how, you know, how do you imagine that they, they can, uh, you know, what sort of solution could they possibly have? Um, I mean, this is a, a national, you know, because now Nebraska, for example, grows all this corn for, the, for uh, our country and the world. But um, how can they possibly just continue to do this? Um, because they're not making, they're not growing enough as it is, and the prices just keep going up and up and up, and people are, the farmers are just really very glad about that. But it's, uh, it's, a, it's a really bad problem. Well, again, I'm not, I don't have all the answers here, you know, I, I, and I think these are the questions that we have to ask together, but I, I, I'm very, I, I very deeply question the, the whole biofuel craze and the, 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 the creation of law in many countries that by such and such a date, a certain amount of the cars have to be running on biofuel and a certain amount of planes have to be running on biofuel and so on, and it just has not taken the water reality into account at all. The water, um, the subsidies for, for biofuel in California alone would, would require another third of the Colorado River. Well, there isn't another third of the Colorado River, but it's like the folks doing the subsidies over here weren't talking to the water experts in their own communities. They weren't talking to Peter Glick. They weren't talking to their own, um, you know, their own bureaucrats who would be able to tell them what's happening. Well, I guess what I'm saying is, and again, these are struggles that we're going to have. These are struggles we're going to have because we are so um, dependent on, on this energy, this cheap energy. Um, and, but as a community, we're going to have to start asking what the water footprint is of every single solitary thing we do, everything we do. I mean, I know that there are some environmental groups in this country who have been supporting fracking because they say, uh, <clears throat> you know, the natural gas is better than coal and, and uh, fossil fuels. Well, yes, that may be, but if it's at the de destruction of water, it's too great a price to pay. And so then we're up against air versus water. We have to take it more holistically. And, and uh, uh, you know, and, there, and while I'm not a big fan of thinking technology is going to save everything, I think there are technologies that we can use that are going to lead us into, um, uh, you know, a decreased use of, of water with, with uh, our food production. A lot of it's got to be, and we know this, a lot of the problems with water is the way we grow food, is the, are the chemicals that we use to grow industrial food and the travel around the world. And we need to come back to more local sustainable food production. It would take a huge part of our, our water footprint back. And by the way, just while I'm on virtual trade or global trade, do you know in 1965, uh, let me get this right now, 60, sorry, 95% of the clothing sold and worn in the United States was made here. And now it's only 5%. It's another, it's another water-guzzling industry, believe it or not, clothing. Um, so just this notion that everything has, has you know, changed so much and we have to find the resources to continue it, it's, it's simply not sustainable. And I don't know when your answer is how can they keep doing it, I'm not sure. Um, who are they, re who are they um, answering to is, is a huge part of the question. I think I have the microphone. Hi. <laughs> um, my field is uh, political economy, and so I want to, uh, and human rights actually, human right to water. And one of the things that comes up continually in my research is a couple of different clashes between the human right to water um, 
and on the one hand, other kinds of human rights, like to housing. Um, and I operate mainly in, in poor, developing urban megacities where housing often means building on watersheds and things like that. So you have a conflict between the human right to water and other kinds of human rights. And then the greater conflict, I think, which is between the human right to water and the, um, the global capitalist system that we live in. And the fact that with uh, increasing flows of trade, um, increasing uh, mobility of capital, et cetera, that you have incentives that work very much against conservation and um, enforcement mechanisms that are much, much stronger than the enforcement mechanisms for protecting the environment or water resources. And I'm wondering, um, I'm not trying to be too pessimistic, I'm, I try to remain optimistic as well, but how would you see dealing with these very real conflicts that are played out to the death sometimes? Yeah. Yeah, just to, um, I'm not sure if everyone was able to hear because of a wee bit of an echo. Um, the, the question is how do you balance the, the, the rights and particularly within a system that favors non-rights, if I could put it, if I could paraphrase you, um, a system that, that, that promotes uh, wealth and power and, and, um, and you know, markets. Uh, over the over the environment, it's a, it's a huge tough fight. I mean, at the UN, they've just done a study where they put a, a dollar amount on nature. It's called PES, uh, Payments for Environmental Services, and part of the concept of it does make some sense, and that is that you will pay to maybe as as has been done in this country for years, the gov the government pays farmers to take care of their land, and rather than have every field going every year to lay, let their fields go fallow and take care of their water, maybe you won't make as much money, but we'll top it up. I mean that to me is fine, but there's an edge to it then that turns around and says, but if that land isn't or that nature or that animal or that species or that watershed isn't worth enough compared to you know, because we've now put a dollar figure on it to what you could make from it, then it loses. And that really frightens me. And that's what happened in China. They actually did a calculation years ago that they could make 60 times more money on a drop of water if they used it for their industrial production for export to for their growth um, than to leave it in watersheds or use it to grow uh, grain. And they made that calculation, and they actually have that number that they, you know, they were able to set on it. So that makes me nervous when we, we say nature has to kind of compete. And so, so I exactly hear what you're saying. I, I, I can, again, only answer that, I mean, part of the work that we do in our organization then is not just on behalf of water. It's against that system, okay? We're fighting really hard against unregulated um, free trade agreements, uh, these, these bilateral investment agreements, the right of corporations to sue governments to set these kind of uh, details, um, the, the stripping of social rights, um, the fights that's going on here in, in uh, Wisconsin, I believe, and, and other places. The new government in Great Britain has just announced it's nothing sacred. Every single social program, every, everything in the commons is to go on the chopping block, and you'll have to prove that it shouldn't. They're absolutely open to opening everything up. And I worry about a day when we have very weakened governments, very weakened ability for uh, the, those who we elect to represent us uh, to be able to do that, to, to work on behalf of the, advocate on behalf of the safety and security of their citizens and, and the environment. Um, so we have to fight the system at the same time that we're, I would argue that we're, that we're, um, that we're fighting for clean water. So. Uh, you know, when I, when I hear an Al Gore giving this powerful message, and yet, and yet for me, the flaw is it's up to you. I, no, <laughs> it's not just up to me. I can do everything possible in my life to cut my energy footprint, but if we allow the continuation of a system as it is, I'm sorry, it, we've got to get, take control of, of an industrial and agri agribusiness industry, in this case, it's killing our water. I mean, just to give you one example, in this trade agreement with Europe, they want, they part, partly what they want is Europe has really strict rules against GM, G, GMO foods, the genetically modified or genetically engineered foods, and Canada puts um, this awful uh, hormone in beef called Revlor H, 
And so they haven't allowed our beef into Europe. So part of the agreement is, well, we'll let you have access to Canada's public water systems if you'll take our beef. So already Alberta, which doesn't have any water left because they're destroying it all with the tar sands, and anyway, they don't have a lot of water, they're going to double or triple their beef uh, uh, growth, their beef production, to send to Europe under this new agreement. They don't have the water. It, so that's where you get, that's where the rubber hits the road. And when I say these governments get together and say they care about the environment and then they come up with an answer that is absolutely phenomenally anti-environmental. I also worry about the big companies recycling, desalination, big companies like GE or Suez that really have put a lot of money into recycling and maybe think it would be a disincentive to making money if governments were to protect source water because there's a lot of money to be made in dirty water. So it's a, I, I hear you very much, and I think we have to build in a, a deep and serious critique of the current system with the advocacy work that we do. So you just kind of touched upon my question, and that was um, tying water issues into other movements, right? Because it's happening within this larger system. Um, so I guess you talked about food and people trying to make food more local. I just would like you to maybe hear, if you could, talk about tying water issues into more like on the ground move, social movements that relate to water. So water is happening, being addressed. Because you've been talking about the law system the UN system, and, and all that matters too, right? But you, as you kind of have alluded to, we almost are in a time where our government officials don't have power and the corporations have most of the power. So that goes back to what are people, what can people do? Yeah. It's not the individual choice, but it's the collective movements. Yeah. Well, there are wonderful grassroots movements all over the world, and they are doing phenomenal things. Um, in Uruguay, a few years ago, they held a plebiscite, and they had to get, I think it was like 25% of the population signing to get a referendum on the ballot, which they got, um, to have an amendment to their constitution, which they won, and the amendment said that water is a human right that must be delivered on a not-for-profit basis by a public agency. So Suez, you know, up and left because that was it. This thing won. That came from the people. That didn't come from the government. That came from the bottom up. You've got movements like that all over Latin America right now. Um, the, Mexico has a similar thing. Colombia, where it's a pretty dangerous place to be an activist, has got a, a huge movement um, gathering similar plebiscite for rep referendum. They've already got enough signatures that by law the government should be allowing the referendum, but the government's not. <laughs> so there, so we're, we're coming in to support them, and this is how our international movement works. We, we share information and support, and we took out an ad, for instance, in the Uruguay situation, because the big companies came back and the World Bank started making noise, and suddenly they were, we might not have won that, and we took out a full-page ad in all the major newspapers, and and said, why? Because they, oh, I know, they were saying, you'll be the only country in the world. Everybody else is moving to these private systems. So we had signatories from all over the world saying, not my country, not my country, not my country. These, these people are lying to you. Um, and it really made a difference. I mean, so this, this solidarity um, is incredible. There was a movement in India to stop what they call river linking. The government wanted to, to literally link all the rivers together. I mean, talk about your mass movement of water. Um, and the people rose up and said, absolutely not. Um, so what I'm finding is, and that's why I talked about the ordinances, is that, and I'm not letting governments off the hook, okay? <laughs> it's really, really important that we, we say we have the right to good governance and we have to continue to fight for it. And we have to continue to fight those who, on the other side, say, you, this is who you serve. You serve us and, and, and not, not the people who voted for you. Um, but we, ha but doing it all from the ground in a grassroots manner is an extraordinarily important part of the work. Um, and I would ask you, and here in this in this area, to support the the Basin Network um, that is uh, coming together through legal means, but others, because I think you're going to have to do public education and lobbying um, to make sure that this uh, basin is 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 protected. That would be a really good thing for people to join um, here in Utah. 
we've run a little bit over and we have a lot of students out in the Great Hall who are waiting to entertain and inform us. And so um, I'd like to, uh, to move us out in that direction. Let me remind you that we have panels beginning at 9 o'clock tomorrow uh, up at the Officers Club at Fort Douglas. And also especially emphasize our second keynote speak, a speech by Peter Glick, which will be at the Moot Courtroom at the Quinney College of Law at 12.15 tomorrow. Uh, programs are available outside. Uh, please join me in thanking you again, Maude Barlow.